Hello, I want to continue talking about the information that we didn't get to cover uh, in class Thursday. Today is Monday, September 21st. I want to finish the presentation on Mississippi, um, Mississippi and Mrs. Hamer and Mississippi uh, Freedom Summer. And I also want to begin the presentation on Malcolm X. Um, last time we were talking about Mrs. Hamer's childhood uh, and the way that she lived in Mississippi. Um, she lived in poverty and the type of police state that she lived in, the type of society that she wanted to change. Um, today I want to continue by talking about an experience that she had uh, called a Mississippi appendectomy in which she went into the hospital for a simple procedure but she came out and found that she could no longer have children. That was something that happened frequently to poor black women in the rural south. They would go in for, for example, an appendectomy and they would find once they were released that they could no longer have children because a medical resident had been um, using them basically as guinea pigs or experimenting on them and they could no longer have children. That happened to Mrs. Hamer and as a result she and her husband Perry Hamer adopted children and raised children but they never had biological children of their own. Um, in 1962 she be went to a meeting of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC and it was at this meeting that she uh, began her activism um, in trying to seek voting rights and other civil rights. It was at a voting rights meeting uh, organized by SNCC um, that she and the others at the meeting vowed to go to Indianola, Mississippi to try to register to vote and continue going there until one of them passed the literacy test. The Mississippi literacy test um, was such that you had to interpret the Mississippi Constitution and there was no way that you could possibly pass it. Uh, somehow Mrs. Hamer eventually did, but no matter how smart you were or how knowledgeable you were about the Constitution, the Mississippi Constitution, you couldn't pass this test. Um, but they vowed to go there and continue going there until they were able to register to vote. Um, after the first time that she went to try to register, as I mentioned in class uh, last week, she'd worked on a plan plantation as a sharecropper for many years uh, and she was eventually fired from her job for just trying to register to vote. In Mississippi they used to re um, print the names and addresses of people who went to register and I think the purpose of it is pretty obvious so that they can intimidate um, people who tried to register to vote. Um, they also, she and the others who had gone to register um, were arrested and fined for driving a bus of the wrong color. A bus was said to be too yellow. So they could find any type of way to harass you if you in any way dare to try to register to vote if you were black. Um, she was harassed on a constant and daily basis. She even referred to that in her Is This America speech. She once received a $35,000 water bill for a house that didn't have running water. She was shot at. Uh, as I mentioned, she was fired from her job. She was evicted and so was everyone in her entire family. Um, she received threats on a constant basis um, and there was another incident in which she and another uh, young student by the name of Anel Ponder had gone to a voter registration uh, training session in South Carolina and when they were on their way back home in Mississippi in a town called Winona, Mississippi, they were um, pulled over and both of them were beaten severely. Um, they were beaten by two black inmates who were told by white guards that if they didn't beat Mrs. Hamer and Miss Ponder that they would beat them. Um, and so that was another really horrible incident that happened to her. And again, it showed that women were treated badly just as the men were if they in any way tried to register to vote or tried to pursue civil rights in any way. In 1964, she by now was a member of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, this was a racially mixed group of people who wanted to change the society in Mississippi. Um, and she, in 1964, traveled with them to Atlantic City to the Democratic National Convention um, and they hoped that they would be seated uh, and allowed, allowed to represent the people of Mississippi rather than the delegates who were there from the Mississippi Democratic Party um, because their argument was that those delegates were segregationists and they weren't. Um, they were denied that opportunity. They were given two, an opportunity to have two at-large seats which would have just been symbolic and they wouldn't have really been able to participate very much and that was something that they turned down. Um, she gave um, a speech called Is This America that you saw an excerpt of in class 
And in that speech, she talked about the way that she and others lived in Mississippi and just the type of society it was and the fact that there was a need for change. Um, and that was a very powerful speech that Lyndon Johnson didn't want the nation to see, so he called a press conference to try to cut it off. But it ended up making the local news shows, and so the nation saw Mrs. Hamer and the gifted and committed or woman that she was. Um, and so that was something that really helped the MFDP because even though they didn't get everything they wanted, they did did get media attention and that was something that was very helpful to them. She continued to try to register voters even after passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 when a lot of communities came up with all types of ways to try to continue to disfranchise blacks. But she would um, file lawsuits and she wanted to make sure that people actually had the right to vote. She introduced Head Start programs which in today's society would be similar to pre-K uh, programs for low-income children of all races. She died in 1977 at the age of 59 of cancer and also of heart disease. She died in poverty just as she had lived, uh, but she was a very courageous and very committed woman who was very much involved in civil rights long beyond uh, 1964. Um, also during Freedom Summer, as the film mentioned, there were three civil rights workers who were murdered in 1964. Their bodies were found then. James Cheney, Mickey Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman were in Meridian, Mississippi to investigate the burning of a church. Um, that's my phone ringing in the background, so hold on to this. Let me answer. <laughs> Okay, now we can continue. My phone was ringing. <laughs> but uh, I was talking about Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney in 1964. They were in Meridian, Meridian Mississippi to investigate the burning of a church. Um, and they were pulled over um, in some type of traffic violation. And they, they disappeared and their bodies were found. The FBI came in to search for them, but their bodies were found months later. Um, and they had been buried in a dam. That was a case that received national uh, attention um, and that also happened in during Freedom Summer in August 1964. There was also a Freedom Vote that was a part of Freedom Summer in which approximately 68,000 people uh, came to participate in the Freedom Vote. And again, the purpose of it was to show that if African Americans were given voting rights, they would actually vote. They did indeed have an interest in voting. Um, and then finally the culmination of Freedom Summer was the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by President Johnson uh, and then a year later the Voting Rights Act of 1965. All right, so you can go ahead. I'm sure you've already read the reading assignment. Um, I want to now talk about if you have the presentation entitled Malcolm X and Black Power. I want to go ahead and get started uh, talking about some things um, from that presentation in terms of the origins of the black power movement and then in class talk a little bit about Malcolm X uh, and the people who influenced him but I want to begin just talking about the origins of black power a lot of this is in the textbook reading that you were assigned um, that's on your syllabus um, the black power movement as we knew of it I guess in the mid and late 1960s when I guess you could argue it was at its height uh, was influenced by the 1965 watch riot there were other race riots taking place th th throughout the 1960s when the cities were uh, burning uh, including in Watts which is near Los Angeles and so that influenced people to become involved in the black power movement simply because a lot of people it showed just how frustrated people were in urban America and that the issue of racism wasn't just a southern problem but there were problems all across the nation James Meredith's march that you read about James Meredith was the first black student at the University of Mississippi he went on a march uh, from Mississippi tried to go to walk to Memphis Tennessee uh, and that was in 1966 but yet he was shot uh, eventually some other people who were allies of him completed the march for him but that again showed just that when he was even admitted to Ole Miss um, there was a riot on campus um, so again that influenced black power when you saw a black student at a white university who was participating in a nonviolent march being shot it, it really angered people and it made people who once had the kind of ideology that Dr. King had to ha adopt a separate type of ideology there were also changes in SNCC that were taking place especially in terms of the racial makeup of SNCC. 
um, a lot of the leadership no longer wanted white students to be involved and the reason was because they felt they would accomplish more if they had an all-black movement and they also believed that if by chance the white students were there that they were basically inhibiting progress even though they had good intentions um, and so there was an ideological split in SNCC in the in the sense that some people wanted it to continue to be a racially mixed uh, group other people wanted the white people out and they wanted it to be a black group because they felt that in order to pursue black power you needed to be a black group you had need to consist of black people <clears throat> and then also there was a leadership change in SNCC when Stokely Carmichael who later went by the name Kwame Ture defeated John Lewis John Lewis who is now in Congress will be on our campus next month to speak um, so there was a, a leadership change in SNCC because Mr. Carmichael um, wanted it to be a black organization. Mr. Lewis wanted it to remain as a racially mixed or organization. So all of those things influenced the black power movement and also we're going to be talking about the Black Panther Party in class Thursday. Um, so based on what you read, and this is a lot of this information is coming uh, from the textbook, um, the black power movement was referred to as being radical, nationalistic, and revolutionary. Um, so from 1966 until approximately 1980, the Black Power Movement emphasized um, group consciousness and solidarity. In other words, black people having solidarity, having a sense of unity, uh, and also radical organizations and leaders. People like Mr. Carmichael and others who had a rhetoric that was more nationalist, whose rhetoric was totally different from that of a Martin Luther King or a John Lewis. So it was radical and nationalistic and revolutionary. Um, from 1966 to approximately 1980 when it really went into decline. Um, the Black Power Movement, as we know of it, went into a decline uh, simply because of internal divisions, because of the leadership problems, the disagreements that the leaders have with each other, uh, the competition among the different organizations, and you're going to see an example of that in the film Nation of Law that we'll be watching in class tomorrow. Um, the harassment that they face, especially from the FBI, programs like COINTELPRO um, that harass them and led to all kinds of uh, issues. And you're going to really be surprised when you see Nation of Law, the things that were happening back then. So the Black Power Movement was destroyed by all of these things. There were other types of divisions as well in terms of gender and sexism. That was a big problem in the party as well. Um, and so that that's something that you can just basically read about in the textbook um, I want to just mention just really quickly some black power ideologies and then I'll stop and we'll talk about Malcolm X tomorrow um, moralists this is all coming from that same presentation on Malcolm X and black power people who are moralists people who are of course like Dr. King these are people who have faith in the American creed um, and they want to appeal to the morals of Americans. So in other words, they want to show Americans that it's immoral to discriminate. It's immoral to disfranchise someone. So Dr. King is probably the person who, when you think about a moralist person, a person who really has faith in American society and the American system of democracy, equality and justice, and believes that most people will believe and furthering those ideals if they could see that discrimination is wrong. Um, another black power ideology that's mentioned in the presentation is that of the pluralist, P-L-U-R-A-L-I-S-T. Um, these are people who also have faith in the American creed, faith in the American society of democracy, equality, and justice. Um, and they also believe that people can gain power in American society by working within the system as it is, despite whatever flaws there are. So, for example, the members of the um, Congressional Black Caucus would probably be people who believe in this. But President Obama would probably be someone who believes in this. If you work through the system, you can accomplish something, but you have to have faith in the American creed. <clears throat> Alienated reformers are people who have little faith in the American creed. Um, but they do believe that groups can gain power by reforming the system. So they, they believe they see a lot of the problems and flaws in the American system, but they do think it can be reformed or changed for the better um, through pro protests, through lawsuits, and through empowering their own communities. So these are people like, uh, I guess Malcolm X probably would have had views like that at some point <clears throat> in his life. Um, people who are not willing to give up on the system yet. They believe that they don't have faith in the way the system works, but they do believe it can be changed for the better. 
Um, the Black Panthers, for example, probably had views um, and, that, and, and probably could have been defined as alienated reformers um, during the 1960s. <coughs> Alienated revolutionaries is the last black power ideology I want to go over. These are people who have little faith, if no faith, in the American creed. And they believe the only way that things can change can be through a revolution, even if it means that there is a violent revolution. So, for example, you're going to see a film, Nation of Law, in class today. The Attica, tomorrow, the Attica prisoners probably would fall under this category. They need. They believe that you can't change a system through lawsuits and protests. There has to be a revolution of some kind. The system has to be completely changed. The New Black Panther Militia, which is a group that um, is in existence in today's society, which is totally different from the Black Panther Party of the 1960s and 70s, um, they probably believe in, in that. Malcolm X, at one time in his life, maybe early in his life when he was released from prison, probably was an alienated revolutionary and later he became an alienated reformer as we're going to talk about in class all right so i think this presentation is a little bit over 15 minutes and i'll just go ahead and stop there uh tomorrow we'll talk about malcolm x and the people who influenced him and we'll also talk about malcolm x as both an alienated revolution a revolutionary and also an alienated reformer so i'll go ahead and just stop there